Jersey's own Zach Gell. Or maybe it's Pennsylvania. Anyhow, it's one of the two, I'm pretty sure. The Zach Gell Show continues on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. Welcome back in, everybody. Time right now in our Princeton Orthopedic Associates Studios, 516. We're here today until 6 o'clock. Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, The Jersey, 609 909-9200. A lot going off the field. Jerry Reese did not address Josh Brown in that incident yesterday and the first time he was made available since training camp. And Josh Huff today, ugly arrest for him from the Philadelphia Eagles. But we do have a big football game on Sunday between the Giants and the Eagles and nobody better to talk to than the former New York football Giants coach from 1997 to 2003 and that's my good friend Jim Fossil who joins us right now coach Fossil how are you I'm doing fantastic how's everything with you well I'm doing great but it is disheartening to continue to see these athletes continue to mess up and then these teams handle them very poorly we know what's going on with the Giants and Josh Brown he's no longer a member of the New York Giants organization but yesterday Jerry Reese would not answer the questions about Josh Brown. You know the Giants are a very classy organization. They're called a gold standard franchise. Are you surprised with the way the Giants have handled this Josh Brown situation? No, because I know what the difficulty of the task is. Uh, Fortunately, I never had that problem. I never had that problem. I think I got rid of a few guys before it got to that level. But here's the dilemma. All right, we live in the United States of America, and the Constitution says... You're innocent until proven, proven guilty. Now, if a player gets in trouble and he's been charged with something, well, okay, now what am I going to do about this? I'm not a judge, and i got to let the law enforcement run the course with it. All right? And I don't want to get involved like the Duke lacrosse team where the girl accused of a bunch of players of raping her and he disbanded the team, fired the coach, kicked the kids out of school, and two weeks later she said, no, they didn't rape me. I made that up. So you got to be a little careful. And the thing I always in my mind said was, I've got to let the law enforcement, but if I, I'll talk to law, law enforcement if they'll tell me something. And I'll talk to the gentleman that got in trouble. And if I feel like it, then I'll suspend him or I'll kick him off the team as fast as I can. But you still got to be careful with that because you're not the law. You do have to be careful, but there was an incident at the Pro Bowl that both the Giants and the NFL were made aware of, and the Giants knew about this abuse, admittedly, to some extent. With that being said, it makes me wonder, why even bring this guy back? Well, that's a good question, and you you got more information on it than I do. And uh, if if you get to the point, I know this, John Merrill won't stand for it. I know that. Even if the coach would let him come back, or I would, John Merrill wouldn't stand for it. And that's what I said. Part of that, what I said was, if I feel very, very confident, and you talk about the Pro Bowl and all that, very confident, talk to the authorities that it is, this is guilt. He is, he is going to be found guilty. Well, then I'd dismiss the guy off the team at that juncture. Well, let me ask you this, though, because you've been in these situations, high-pressured situations in New York where there's a lot of backlash from the media and everything you do is magnified. If you're a head coach, I actually feel bad for the coach and the players here in this situation because originally John Mara did not speak about this, and then Jerry Reese would not address it yesterday. Now, Mara has spoken about it, but Jerry Reese did not. If I was a coach and a player, Jim, I would be annoyed that the owner and the general manager aren't doing their due diligence in this. Well, yeah, and again, you probably know a lot more than I do about it. And, and I think sometimes with Jerry Reese, uh, you know, he could be under direction that says, you're not going to comment on this. We're not going to comment because we don't want to make the guy be guilty or we don't have to go to court with this thing and all that stuff. So let the, let the authorities do their job. And then we, they've done it. They, they've released him. And uh, right now they, their attitude may be case closed for us. Now, he's going to go into, he may get charged and go to court and go to jail or whatever it is. But uh, at some point in time, I know the media wants every answer every time. And I know Jerry Reese very well. He's an outstanding person. John Mara, I have all respect for. So I'm sure they've talked about that, and their best avenue is what they're doing right now. And, you know, you're right. I mean, when you're, when you're a coach or an owner like that, 
uh, with the media, you are. it's pretty hard to ever be right. Yeah, and we're talking to Jim Fossil here on the Zach Gelb Show. Jim, let's just also a league issue, and it's not only in the NFL. We see it in a lot of sports. There's a lot of cases of domestic violence. Just today, and I know you may not know this, but a Mets pitcher was arrested for allegedly having domestic abuse, and you see the situation with Josh Brown. In the past, there's been Ray Rice and Greg Hardy. It seems like now these things are more frequent, and yes, they could have been happening back in the day 20, 30 years ago, but now we know a lot more about them because the way these things are covered. How do the leagues do a better job in making sure these athletes are reprimanded? Because the NFL, I don't think they've done a great job in these situations. No, and you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, and this is the truth, my father raised me a certain way. You're right. And I had two sisters, two sisters. And he said, there is never, I don't care what went down, you never lay a hand on a girl. Never, ever. The only thing was if somebody's coming at you with a knife to defend yourself. Other than that, I don't care what went down. If you ever hit your sister or another girl, I'm going to, I mean, I won't go into what he said he did to me. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, you know, it's, it's not just an, uh, an athletic problem. It is, it's a nationwide problem. I mean, it's people that aren't athletes. And I think that maybe what we need to do is stiffen the penalties. Um, and that may, may, may help, um, you know, settle people down. Uh, and I think the only thing the league can do is really do an intense training not just with the rookies coming in. I'm talking about going to each club in training camp and talking to them. And they may be doing that right now. I don't know. Uh, they can tighten the rules the best they can. But, again, I go back to the same thing. you got, you got to walk a little bit gently because if you really punish a guy and then all of a sudden the wife says, no, I made it up, oh, boy. I mean, you're really in trouble as, a, as an organization. So I think they can, they can continue to counsel, and not just the rookies, but go to every team in the off season with a meeting and explain things. Jim, let me also ask you this, because we saw another issue develop today in Philadelphia with Josh Huff. He was arrested and he was speeding, allegedly had a gun and did not have a permit to carry that gun in either Philadelphia or New Jersey. It was a, a permit in Texas and there was also marijuana in the car. And when you're a coach and you have a situation like that, how do you handle it? Well, stupid is as stupid is. You got all that going on, you know. And uh, you know, as a coach, I mean, I, I addressed my, with my team all the time. You know, I said, "Hey, I, I, I had a player one time got pulled over, and uh, and everything. I won't go into who it was or anything. And and I and I blasted it because I, I had to go get him out of jail. And I said, if you ever do this again, I don't want to put up with this. Okay, you won't be here. That'll be my choice. You won't be here." And it wasn't severe, you know. Uh, he had an open container in the car, all right, and uh, and that's all it was: open container in the car. And but I said, you, you're going to throw your whole career down the tubes because I guarantee you, if I cut you, uh, somebody might pick you up, but not no. And you're going to be all over the news, and I think that's going to hurt your career. So I think as a coach, and especially as a head coach, and this is where I think guys make a transition between being a coordinator and a head coach. There's a lot more to it than X and O's that you have to handle, and you have to be in the middle of things. And I always had guys with their ears open down in the locker room by leaders, and I said, if anything's going down or you hear anything's going down, you better come to me, and I'll, and I'll cut it off before it gets to be a problem. And also, Josh Huff is not that good of a football player. He's not been very productive in his career in Philadelphia. And it's a shame because we should be talking in this conversation more Giants and Eagles, and we're talking about Josh Huff because of his stupid actions, Coach. Well, I know it, and, that, and that's that's the sad part of it. But it's, uh, you know, the media is going to jump on this stuff, and they should. I'm not criticizing them at all. But it becomes uh, a story, and everybody wants to, you know, jump on it right away. And uh, But I think – at the end of the day, it may sound bad to the public, but I think it goes away to making some of these players at least wake up, be smart, and see these guys get arrested or they get kicked off the team or they're cut out of the league or they're suspended for this or that, uh, that hopefully some of these guys, uh, their eyes get open 
And and they got to realize, I tell them, you know, you're not a normal 22-year-old. Anything you do that is wrong is going to be in a paper. Your best friend could do the same thing, and nobody even know about it because it's not going to get to the media. But you, you are going to go to the media. They're going to get it, and they're going to blow it up, and they're going to make you look bad. Jim Fossil with us right now on the Zach Gelb Show. Coach, let's get into this matchup, and it's an intriguing one. Always when the Giants and the Eagles play one another, this time it's up the turnpike at MetLife Stadium. Both these coaches, they're rookie coaches with uh, Doug Peterson and then Ben McAdoo. You were a coach in New York. There's some people, they don't have the DNA in them to be a coach in a big city like a New York or Philadelphia. And in your first year, you had a lot of success going 10-5-1 and and getting the team to the playoffs. With everything being magnified in a big city, how tough is it as a head coach, and you're still learning in that first year, to learn with everything that is covered about your football team? Well, yeah, and I, uh, all my friends told me, don't take that Giants job. It's a bad team, and you're, the New York media is rough and all that. That's a, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And I said, no, I want to go where the, the, the fans are passionate about their team. And, uh, you know, uh, we just went back to basics with what we were going to do. We were, we were the only team picked in the whole NFL, the only team picked to finish last in their division. And we were we we ended up being the first one to go undefeated in the NFC East, and we did it by basic fundamentals. And the number one fundamental and the number one thing that predicts winning and losing is turnover ratio. And I I, I drove it into them every day, every day, from training camp to all through the season. And we ended up plus twenty five, and that's how we did it. We weren't a better team than anybody. We didn't have better personnel than anybody. We didn't have it, but we had plus twenty five. And I think that, you know, <clears throat> making the transition from a coordinator to a head coach, and I'd been a head coach in college, and I had coordinated four other teams, that when you make that transition to be a head coach, there's a lot more to it than X's and O's. And you got to let some of that stuff go so you can know exactly what you have to get out of this team. And getting turnover ratio there, and that's a, that's a little bit scary thing for me right now. they got the same record. And Philly is plus six, and the Giants are minus seven. Minus seven, I, that, that, I would say you're probably about one and five right now, or one and six. But, uh, you know, they're, they're four and three, and they're all tied up. A big word is delegation, and these head coaches, there's a lot of pressure on them. They have to delegate and also trust their staff. There are some rumors, and Ben McAdoo contemplated it during the bye week. It seems like he's not going to do this. But this has been an offense that's been struggling. This has been his forte. It's been the offense. That's what he was brought here as the head coach and also the offensive coordinator a few years ago. Should Ben McAdoo give up his offensive play calling duties, coach? I wouldn't do that. I did not do that uh, until uh, actually what happened was my mother died in the middle of the season and I had to travel to California and I just said, man, I'm worn out. I have hardly slept. Um, in fairness to the team, uh, I'm not prepared to do it. And so I made the switch and I handed it off to Sean Payton. Uh, but I look back on it and I maybe should have removed myself a little bit, not, not uh, given that up at that time because for me it wasn't hard. I mean, it, 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 was, it was exhausting. But it was, wasn't hard. And when I, when I went back and started calling the plays again, we really had one of the best offenses. We had the best offense, highest scoring in the league. Uh, and I think you can do it. And I think if you don't want to do it, you need to stay very, very, very active in the middle of all that stuff. You can't just say, now I'm the head coach and I'll do all this other stuff and I'm not going to be the X and O guy. I, th- I think, you know, he's just got he's to internalize the thing and say, what, what, what am I doing differently? Because you got time. To do it it's just so you're going to be working from six in the morning to midnight coach i've told you this before and i always love when you come on with us as we're talking to the great coach jim fossil on the zach gelb show fox sports 920 the jersey i'm still baffled even with the success that you had in new york that you never got another chance in the national football league as a head coach i'm just wondering since we're talking about things being magnified in a big market if you were a coach in a smaller market do you think you may have gotten another chance in the national football league as a head coach no, not really, because right after uh, things went down at New York, 
I uh, interviewed at three places, and the, the problem there was the one Redskins. I was going to go there. I mean, we were yeah, all remember that had the deal done, and uh, he uh, offered it to Joe Gibbs, and Joe shouldn't have returned, but I had it. And then the next time, he was going to hire me. I mean, I, I was starting to put the staff together, and then Dan Snyder's right hand man kind of snuck his own guy in there. And uh, the other interviews I did that first year right afterwards, I was running about 103 temperature, and I, I didn't do a good job. I, I, I'll blame myself on that. And uh, twice the Rams called me in, and uh, as a head coach, the first time they thought I was too strong for the general manager. Uh, the second time they said, uh, we want to get a defensive coach, which neither one of them worked out very well. And then I know Carl Peterson interviewed me at uh, – Kansas City, and he said, I'm so far down the line, but I should have just hired you right then. And so, you know, I, and, and the thing is, I remember talking to Tony Dungy years ago, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit interviewing because what happens is I'm kind of, I'm, I'm an interview guy, okay? For whatever reason, they all want to talk to him, and then if you don't hire him, then when the next team is talking to him, they'll ask that, they'll ask that team, what's wrong? Well, he's not real strong. Well, he's this. Maybe he's this. They're never going to say, oh, no, he's the best guy. I just didn't hire him. There's going to be a fault with you. And then you build that up. And, Ernie, and Tony said, you know, I think every time I go to an interview, then if I don't get it, they tell the other team that is interested in me that we don't like him that well. So, you know, and I don't know. It, it's an agent-driven business right now. And also, you know, Brian Billick, who uh, won the Super Bowl. Surprising. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he ever got an interview. Yeah, no, it's very surprising. These interviews, they're rigorous process. We, we, we see sometimes some of the questions that are asked, even at the combine for the players. What are some type of questions that are asked for a coach in some of these interview processes? Well, uh, I, I, I would say that um, the first thing, like for me, when George Young and I sat down, uh, you know, he wanted to go over staffing. And the most important staff, uh, as a head coach, I'm an offensive guy. I'm going to be involved with the offense. My most important hire defense. is the defensive coordinator. Yep. You know, uh, and, then, and then just talk about it. And then talk about philosophy. And, and the thing about George Young, he knew the game now. You know, he played the game. He coached the game. He administered the game and all that. So he knew what, in his mind, was going to be important. And you know, uh, what do you what do you what do you attribute to coaching? What 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 has to happen? And the first thing I told him right then is the turnover ratio. Every year, every year, turnover ratio. And if you look at the stats, there's 12 teams that go to the playoffs every year. Never have I ever seen two teams, more than two teams, get in the playoffs that have an upside down. And most of the time, those two teams are minus one or minus two. They're right there. Everybody else is plus in turnover ratio. So, and it's the number one factor in winning and losing. So I think, he, uh, you know, they want to delve into your philosophy of coaching, you know, and not just X's and O's and those type of things. But, uh, and, and when I've interviewed with the other places, it, it's, it's beyond the offense and defense. It's beyond it. it, it can you think out of the box? And how would you manage all this stuff? Because it's, it's hard when you're running one side of the ball and then you're also the head coach. And you mentioned that defense and that turnover ratio. When you were the coach of the Giants, you also had to prepare when you play the Eagles for a Jim Johnson defense. What was that like? Oh, uh, it was. Uh, he, he was an outstanding coach. After being, you know, my when I when I took the job, um, we beat them nine straight times. Okay, four years we beat them nine all nine games, and uh, you try to figure out. You know, you want to – the biggest thing was Donovan McNabb was a young quarterback. And I told the defense, I said, hey, guys, do not let him out of the pocket. If he throws from the pocket and we don't get a sack on him, okay. But if he gets out of the pocket, uh, they're going to beat us. And when he learned in the fifth year, his first, my fifth year there, when he learned how to throw the ball better out of the pocket, which he did, then we started to split with them. Or, you know, they would win one or we'd win one and all that stuff. And so I think it's as much anything as, yeah, Jim Johnson was an outstanding coach. Uh, after you play for a guy, I'm sure he had good stats on us, and I had, I had a good feel of what he was going to do. Uh, so it became a, 
came, we had awfully good games with him, but we were very fortunate the first four years. It's funny you bring up Donovan McNabb. Now they have a sensation at quarterback, another young quarterback, and that's Carson Wentz. What are your thoughts on Carson Wentz as a quarterback in this league? Oh, I really like him. I, I like him a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the two, two quarterbacks that are really doing well are both rookies in Dallas and in the Philly. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see these guys come in and play so well, uh, especially Prescott. I mean, the guy was, what was he, a fifth-round pick or a fourth-round pick? Fourth-round pick, but, yeah. I mean, yeah, and uh, the way he is playing, that he's got them on top in the division. And then there's another rookie one. And the interesting thing is, the, I think that uh, uh, of the young guys – and uh, the guy that hasn't been playing that much, that Eli Manning has a lower rating than all of them. And, I, you know, you can't just blame it on, on, on Eli. I mean, it's the whole offense that's playing. But uh, if, you, if you just started the season, I'd say Eli would be the top-rated quarterback. But he's not. It, it's really an in, interesting year. You win and lose a job, really, with the way that you draft at that quarterback position if you need to get a quarterback. Because if you use a pick early like the Eagles and do so much to trade up for a Carson Wentz and he turns out to be a bust, you set that franchise back for a long time. Now the Eagles were able to get stuff back with trading away Sam Bradford once Teddy Bridgewater went down. But it does look like they have the real deal in Carson Wentz. When you're evaluating a player in the draft, and Carson Wentz, was playing on the FCS level. How do you know that you have the right player? Because he's been sensational, Coach. Well, yeah, I, I, to me, it's really about the guy's personality, the leadership skills he has. Because if you look at the uh, – and when you bring that up, the Rams are the ones that I'm really concerned about. You know, they've moved all the way to the top. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> their, their guy hadn't even played it down, you know. And I only reason I say that is, you know, my son's a yep. special teams coordinator with the Rams, so I'm, I'm – watching them all the time, but, uh, you know, the mistakes that are made in getting a quarterback is just look at his athletic ability and his, and his arm strength. That, that if you look at, if you just list all the quarterbacks that were cut or didn't work out and they were a very high pick, it's probably because of their intelligence, their leadership quality, or their work ethic. That, that's what gets them, and I can tell you every one of them and what was wrong with them. And where do these other guys come from? You know, uh, Drew Brees, I mean, gosh, the guy isn't tall enough. He's not strong enough. He's not this. He's not. He's a leader. How about Tom and Brady? Every quarterback. Tom Brady. I mean, I go back to Phil Simms. Yeah. <laughs> Phil Simms a leader. <laughs> he's a, a leader. Point. You know what I mean? And John Elway. I had John in college and in the pros. John is a smart guy. He's athletic. But he, he, he studies it. He worked at it. Okay? And even uh, – Oh, gosh, I mean, Kerry Collins, when we changed him over, um, you know, he was a leader out there. And uh, Boomer Esiason, I had in Arizona. Gosh sakes, I mean, we did some dramatic things on an offense that wasn't supposed to be very good. But his leadership and, and his preparation and, you know, good quarterbacks, they demand it from the other players. The offensive line, you know, Phil Sims, I remember my first year in the league. I mean, he'd keep those offensive linemen back, stay out, stay back on uh, Wednesday night. And he sat in with those linemen and he bought them beer and they had pizza and they went over everything. So everybody's on the same page. And the next day you got the receivers in there and the tight ends, he, you know, quarterbacks making sure the ones that don't make it aren't working at it. They're not working at it. Why isn't golf starting right now? Well, I don't know. I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue because my, the deal with my son is, I, I don't want to talk to him about anything that goes on in the organization. A lot of people think, you know, he's the master of trick plays, okay, on, on special teams. I mean, everybody in the league I talk to says, God, your son's got all these trick plays and we're scared to even rush him. Um, and I don't want to know anything. I don't. I never ask him how many trick plays you got, surprise stuff. I don't want to know because I don't want if it ever got out, I don't want him looking at me. Um, but uh, with golf, I don't know. I have no clue. I mean, it's either got to be intelligence or leadership or work ethic like I was talking about. But I, I like the guy when I what I saw of him playing in college. I like the guy. But I don't know. I don't really know.
Now, did you talk to your son about his performance in Hard Knocks? That was absolutely awesome when he was the beach character getting brought in on that surfboard. That was great, Coach. Oh, I know. You know, you know the one thing he brings to the table, and uh, I've gone into his meetings the night before. Jeff Fisher said, you know, I, if I go to a game, away game or something like that, I'll go in, and he, I think he gets a half hour for special teams, and he spends about 15 minutes, and then he does card tricks or different things like that. And those players love it. And then finally, all the coaches start coming in. They wanted to hear his meeting because it was so much fun and energetic. And then players start coming in, sitting in on the special teams uh, meeting. He brings a different dimension. He, he really believes, and he's got to make it fun for them. Well, if, he, if it's boring and all that, it's not going to get there. But he, he, uh, he really goes at it in the right way. The, play, the players love him. I mean, all the players come up to me and say, it's so much fun playing for him. He's energetic. He's enthusiastic. You know, he doesn't cuss at us or anything like that, but they perform. Well, he'll be a head coach soon, and I'm sure you're going to be a very proud father when that happens. But, Jim, I could talk football with you all day. I appreciate the time, though, my friend. Be well. I enjoy it. Anytime.